Hello everyone and welcome back to our class in Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning and Finance. In this short video we're going to have a look at Subtech in contrast to Rectech and um, to define Subtech actually it's the mirror image of Rectech just on the side of financial supervisors and regulators. So it can be considered a sub-discipline of Rectech um, but actually um, it can also be seen as um, an extension or actually the mirror image um, on the side of supervisors and regulators. So it's artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques that are used by regulators and supervisors as part of their supervisory actions and uh, their supervisory conduct, um, such that we have financial authorities uh, like BaFin in Germany, uh, the FCA. FCA in the uh, UK and uh, other authorities and whenever they use big data, whenever they use AI and machine learning to support the supervision of financial institutions, this is what we call subtech. So um, it's closely related to regtech but obviously um, companies have an incentive to comply with regulations and make this as efficient and cost efficient as possible, whereas REC, um, Subtech, sorry, Subtech is supposed to uh, not only make this process more efficient on the side of supervisors, but also um, to identify more patterns, to identify more frauds, uh, more potential problems, threats to financial stability, etc. And this is why the focus is usually on misconduct analysis on the reporting done by financial institutions and managing all the data that is coming into financial supervisors. And actually what you hear from many consultants and uh, representatives of financial institutions is that they usually complain that uh, they have no idea and they have no clue what the financial supervisors are doing with all the data they are compiling and with usually financial supervisory agencies being um, let's say, having less funding than their counterparts in the private uh, industry, um, it, it probably makes sense to invest in big data and in AI and ML technologies in order to process all this data. Some examples, for example, the collection and management of detailed data on loans in the euro area. You can actually go to this link at the European Central Bank here. Um, and the Accelerating subtech solutions and prototyping R2 Accelerator. That's another um, website where you can get some initial information uh, on this relatively new field. And um, it seems as if most supervisory agencies are still looking into subtech uh, and trying out at least some technologies, but uh, this is not yet uh, widely recognized or widely distributed in. Um, the realm of financial supervisors. Um, there was one survey um, among 39 financial authorities from 31 countries about the implementation of subtech strategies. And what they found is that they identified two broad approaches uh, which supervisors uh, followed. The first one is a specific subtech uh, roadmap based on particular needs of a department and this approach tends to be more experimental that um, departments within a financial supervisor say, okay, we might be in need of, let's say, an, a model to identify um, fraudulent transactions in a stock exchange, for example, in a market, um, and then things are experimented with. And the second one is an institution-wide digital transformation and data-driven innovation program, which is a broader, much broader approach that encompasses usually the whole supervisory agency because uh, management and governors of the agency have decided that they need um, a transformation of their overall IT. And then of course, it makes sense to concentrate on AI and ML technologies as part of that IT transformation within the whole agency. And this is what they found out this strategy by the F FSI um, actually 50% said we have no strategy at all. So you can see that this is still very experimental with most supervisors. And as a conclusion, subtech is still in its infancy. 
but it's gaining momentum because we've seen that uh, the institutions that are supervised and regulated, they are investing in reg tech. So it makes sense that agencies, uh, supervisory agencies, uh, keep track uh, of this development and uh, they follow in the footsteps of the institutions they're supposed to supervise. So uh, even though this is still experimental or in a developmental stage, uh, we will see many financial supervisory agencies investing more in ML and AI technologies as part of uh, financial supervision. Um, problem, of course, is these agencies usually have much less funding uh, at their disposal than companies uh, that are supervised. But if we take the example of Germany and uh, the recent blunder uh, with uh, Wirecard, the Wirecard scandal, uh, it's likely that BaFin will be reformed to some extent and will probably uh, also explore new ways to um, identify um, threats to financial stability and uh, financial misconduct. Um, another topic that is related to supervision and regulation in this context are systemic risks. Now, systemic risk, uh, we you probably know this uh, from other lectures, other classes on financial supervision and regulation. Financial stability is one main goal uh, in financial supervision. Supervisors aim to uh, achieve financial stability to prevent financial crises. And the question is, uh, how is AI and ML and the usage of AI and ML in finance related to systemic risk? Well, there are two sides uh, to this coin, actually. One, obviously, is that AI and ML can be used by financial institutions, for example, to keep better track of risk uh, exposure, to uh, manage risks more proficiently and better um, in uh, the bank, in the insurance company, and thus the usage of AI and ML can actually enhance um, financial stability simply by doing a better job in, let's say, risk management and in trading. The other side to this coin is that obviously um, on the bad side, AI and ML technologies can also uh, themselves cause systemic risk. So actually AI and ML and the widespread use we will see in finance, in the financial sector of AI and ML might be a future driver of systemic risk. And um, why is that? Well, especially when we're using it in regulatory functions, first of all, AI is unable to reason about events it has not yet been exposed to. We've seen in our um, modeling that um, a feature or an important aspect of ML methods is their ability to generalize to new data. Humans can draw on a broad range of prior experience and also have imagination. AI doesn't have that. It can only extrapolate from what it has seen before. And we can hope that a model that has been properly trained um, doesn't do overfitting and um, generalize well to new data. That's the problem. We've seen in many financial crises, um, sometimes things repeat themselves, but usually crises uh, happen because we have something rather new happening uh, or a new combination of things that leads to a crisis, um, just like the COVID crisis we've just seen um, with also something uh, at least mankind hasn't seen for some decades or even centuries. Um, second problem is we do not know how AI makes decisions. It is too complex for us to follow. It is usually a black box and it most certainly is a black box to external stakeholders um, so that only the companies usually know how their AI methods works. Uh, in transparency and um, uh, opacity is never a good thing in financial institutions. Uh, as soon as investors, stakeholders, uh, debt holders do not know what happens inside a bank, inside an insurance company, uh, this leads to uh, uncertainty and this on the part of investors. And this in the end might lead to panicky reactions uh, to news and thus to financial crises in the very, very end. Um, so that AI being a black box uh, in itself might cause some problems on the way um, when other things also happen. Third 
factor is AI is more likely to amplify current cycles. It's uh, prone to pro-cyclicality than human regulators. And the problem is that automation favors homogenous methodologies and standardization. And this leads to the problem of pro-cyclicality, meaning that if we know this from regulation, pro-cyclicality and pro-cyclical regulation means that if markets go down, uh, you go hard on banks and you strengthen the crisis. Actually, you, um, you make it worse by regulation. And as soon as uh, you have a boom phase, uh, you loosen up regulation again and thus you cause the next crisis. Now, anti-cyclicality and anti-cyclical regulation is usually what nowadays financial economists believe to be a much smarter approach, meaning that if the economy takes a turn to the worse, for the worse, um, you loosen regulation in order for the economy to recover more quickly. And then um, in the boom phase, you tighten regulation in order to prevent uh, excessive behavior by banks, excessive lending uh, that would cause the next crisis. Well, AI is unfortunately quite pro-cyclical. And then the high predictability and transparency of AI will enable individuals to bet against it. This is a very general principle, but imagine that all players, all investors in the stock market were AI methods and automated bots that train um, that have been trained on data and that trade uh, based on AI and machine learning algorithms. Then you only need one human to understand how all these bots and all these robo advisors, robo traders, all these algorithms, how all these work in tandem, and a human will be able to beat those systems quite easily because all these models are predictable and usually quite transparent when it comes to the way they function. So that's why um, some problems might be caused simply by the fact that AI is more predictable in this sense. And here it is interesting to look at this um, uh, distinction between exogenous and endogenous risk. Well, exogenous risk, this is made, has been made famous by uh, Jon Danielson at LSE, and exogenous risk is caused by events from the outside, much like an asteroid falling on London or on Berlin or on Washington. It is easy to measure. It's purely exogenous, and you cannot really do anything about that when it comes to, let's say, financial investments. Now, AI and machine learning as part of AI is suited well for the evaluation on management of exogenous risk. You have signals coming in, you train your models, you use, use large data sets, uh, you have well-established statistical methods and repeated events to train. So uh, if you have enough data, if you've seen enough um, asteroids, if you've seen the um, um, data um, on uh, past asteroid sightings and uh, astrophysical data, you can try to teach and train your model and then predict future asteroids. Thus, AI is well suited for micro-regulation, internal risk management of exogenous events. The problem is uh, you also have endogenous risk. Endogenous risk is caused by events from within the system. So it starts when individuals um, and individual entities within the system stop acting independently, but synchronize their behavior. It's very difficult to measure. And um, this prime example by John, John Danielson from LSE is the London Millennium Bridge, um, which when it was opened uh, for the millennium in 99 or 2000, I guess, um, the Millennium Bridge um, was specifically designed to withstand the wind that uh, flows along the River Thames. Um, and actually risk management was in place uh, for the bridge to be safe when it gets windy. The problem is if you have people standing on the bridge and the calculations that were done uh, are actually were actually random, uh, this shouldn't be a problem. But people standing on the bridge when it, get when it gets windy, they start to counteract. They start to act in a synchronized way because the bridge starts to um, swing 
because of the wind. And then everyone isn't acting in a random way. No one uh, continues walking in a random same manner as they would if there were no wind, but everyone starts to counteract the movements of the bridge. And these movements, these counter movements by the people on the bridge, not the wind, this caused the bridge to become unstable so that they actually had to close the bridge for some time and do some renovations. And this is a prime example of endogenous risk. You see, uh, the risk is not the wind. That's the exogenous risk. The risk, the endogenous risk, I these are the individual entities, the humans on the bridge, that stop acting independently, but they start to synchronize their behavior. And artificial intelligence uh, methods, they are trained with various games for situations, including interactions between entities. So we have full information games. So for example, in chess, all possible moves can be known, and deep neural networks succeed in these games because they assume their opponent is their clone, knows the same, and they do not prepare for endogenous risk situations. They simply uh, they cover all bases when it comes to exogenous risk. We have incomplete information games. For example, in poker, the opponent's cards are unknown, and AI performs worse than human players because it cannot theorize about the opponent's intentions. It can only learn from past moves. And we have cooperative games. Success is even more difficult for AI when cooperation leads to multiple local optima. And uh, this is, for example, the case in diplomacy and in, in game theory. Um, and this is where um, it becomes quite difficult for AI to be the human, and this will limit uh, the use of AI in these situations. Okay. So this is what I wanted to talk about, uh, subtech and systemic risk. Um, there are more and more discussions on the way when it comes to systemic risk um, and the use of AI and ML in finance, because as you can imagine, AI and ML will be used in trading, it will be used in lending, um, and so on. In many instances, we'll cover and we'll touch ethical considerations. I will talk about this in the next video, um, but you can see that with AI and ML not being rolled out in all parts of the financial industry yet. Uh, we cannot think about all possibilities where in the future AI and ML will be maybe a cause of systemic risk, um, but supervisors and regulators obviously are already concerned about potentials and potential threats to financial stability. So in the next video, we'll have a final look at some ethical considerations.